Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. This is actually the uh, second one in our uh, series of generative AI webinars. Um, the first one, we explained the, you know, the basic concepts of uh, Gen AI and, and some of the applications that people are using. And we will go uh, briefly over that because some people we recognize are joining for the first time. Uh, let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Alok Pant. I'm CEO of Unwired, based in Houston, Texas. Really uh, very glad to welcome our CTO, uh, Srini Subramanian, um, on this um, discussion today. Uh, Srini will be, he heads up our Generative AI uh, Center of Innovation, and he will be the main speaker today, and he'll go through you know, the, the Gen AI use cases, the concepts, but today we'll focus on agents. Um, and yesterday we were at an event and actually somebody was asking me, what is an agent, right? Um, and so I was thinking about it. Maybe the best way to describe an agent is, um, let's say you get up in the morning, right? And um, there is somebody who can make your, uh, can co make your coffee, uh, maybe make some breakfast also and drop your kids off to school. And all without, you know, coming to you, doing it on their own. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, that's what an agent is. They basically can do three or four or as many different tasks as you want independently and, uh, you know, get make simplify your life. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how Gen AI agents can actually automate workflows and simplify our lives here. So before we dive into the webinar, some, I guess, uh, opening remarks here. Um, you can submit your questions throughout uh, the webinar in the Q&A chat box here, and we will also have an interactive Q&A at the end. So please, uh, you know, and then uh, we'll open up the lines. You can either speak your questions out aloud or, you know, still text. So we definitely want to make this interactive, answer all your questions. And we also have a special offer for all our, all our attendees today. Um, we are offering a free uh, strategy consulting workshop so if you are beginning to think of uh, hey, your Gen AI journey, you're not sure about the risk, the cost, which models to use, um, you know, and how do you bring it all together? What is that use case? We are happy to, uh, you know, um, share our experience with you and help you define, uh, a, you know, your first use case or your POC that could, you know, help you start your journey here. Um, and um, uh, there are two ways we can do this. So, we, you know, you can start with one of the more common use cases is really about uh, enterprise search and uh, document processing. We have an out of the box app for that that can quickly, you know, jumpstart your journey here. But you can also start off with a POC for a custom Gen AI app. Maybe you have a great idea there that can help you differentiate your business. We can certainly, you know, explore at building that custom um, Gen AI app also. Um, so here's a quick look at the agenda. Um, so we're going to give you a brief overview of Unwired. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the techniques. It's called uh, retrieval augmented generation to do some enterprise search. This is more because this is what we discussed last time. So I think it will help uh, ca people catch up with some of the discussions. And then, of course, we will focus on the main topic for today, which is the agents. Uh, we'll discuss the enterprise use cases. And, um, and there'll, there'll be definitely more than talk. Uh, Shini will actually do a live demo to show you how these agents work. Um, and then, of course, we'll have Q&A. So Unwired, um, we've been in business for over 10 years, um, uh, incorporated in Houston, Texas. Um, we are a certified SAP partner, also a Google Cloud partner. Um, and our solutions, we are really a, a focused digital solutions company. Uh, we um, build a lot of mobile apps, web apps. Um, and in a lot of our customers are industrial customers, chemicals, utilities, oil and gas. And we're really focusing now on building predictive and generative AI apps. And we'll talk about that. So what are our Gen AI services? So we talked about um, our consulting, uh, you know, um, services and the workshop that we can do for you. We, of course, develop a lot of Gen AI apps. And then we built accelerators to help, um, um, you know, quick start projects. and then. There is also the whole um, aspect of lifecycle management of Gen AI uh, applications or any application. So we can help to prioritize these applications, evaluate the models over the lifetime, tweak them, and, 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 and optimize them for cost. So there is that whole lifecycle Gen AI ops, uh, which we are also looking at. 
Um, we've got, uh, you know, um, constant recognition, uh, um, the most recent being a featured in Gartner reports uh, in 2022. Uh, we got an award for customer experience, building apps in that area. And we also became a Google Cloud partner. And in addition to, of course, uh, you know, we keep our SAP certifications recertified. So our key differentiators are uh, the, gen the center of excellence we built for Gen AI, the accelerators we have built here, and uh, you know we have very happy reference customers. So uh, with that, let's get uh, let's start diving into the topic today, Gen AI. Uh, before we do that, a quick recap of our first webinar, which was about deploying your first Gen AI app in you know um, quickly in four weeks. We talked about uh, one of the techniques called RAG, and we'll spend a minute on that. And we'll also send to you guys a link for this first webinar we did, which talks about uh, you know you uh, doing uh, natural language reporting and also uh, you know using search and document processing. So that link you will get. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, transition uh, over to our CTO. But before I do that, uh, you know we are going to just to give you an overview. So what is uh, Gen AI and how does this work, right? Um, so. I, I'm going to try to explain it um, as I first understood it when I was, you know, when we were trying to, um, you know, really understand this. So the idea here is that you take the data that you have, everything is converted into a vector database, and then the large language model, it could be OpenAI or Google Vertex, that acts upon your vector database and gives you the output or the answers that you're looking for. It That generates the content. So this very simply put, a vector database, LLM acts on it, you get the answer. So with that, uh, Srini, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can educate our audience about the agents we are building and maybe starting off with RAG a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Alok. So uh, hello, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. So <clears throat> like Alok mentioned, uh, you know, RAG or retrieval augmented generation was a topic we covered in a fair amount of detail in our last webinar. Uh, so let me quickly go through the uh, highlights of what this uh, topic is really. Uh, you know, the most common thing I guess uh, being discussed these days is being able to chat with your PDF or with your documents, or maybe chat with your website, right? Effectively, what you're looking at in all these cases is some kind of a variation of RAG. Uh, when I say variation, uh, what that really means is how this information is collated and then sent to the LLM is basically where the differences are, right? So let's look at an example here. Uh, so when we say, how does it work? And we're saying user inputs a query and then relevant data is fed, right? Let's say you have a hundred page PDF, right? And then you're looking at some answers from this PDF because obviously you know it's there, but you don't want to read the whole thing. And that's where LLMs do a great job. But feeding this hundred page PDF, you know, altogether to an LLM, uh, it doesn't make much sense simply because LLMs in that sense, as of today, are stateless, right? They act upon the information you give them during that specific API call or invocation. And then after that, they forget about it. They don't retain that information. It's uh, more the job of the, uh, the RAG agent or any other agent to really keep the memory there. And uh, passing this document every time and then getting it back is kind of meaningless and is also not pra practical. So what's done is that's where the vector database comes in. So in effect, what you do is you go through the document, convert it, let's say, into small paragraphs, and then represent them you know, in vector databases. Uh, how does a vector database uh, differ from a typical database is just that rather than doing a syntactical search, which is you're looking for maybe a like comparison or maybe a specific text, you actually look for meaning in a vector database, right? The semantic search, as people say. So you represent your PDF in paragraphs or chunks, which is the technical term, put it into the vector database. So when you look for a question answer, we actually run that question first on the vector database. So you effectively try to extract relevant portions of that document, and then you're only giving those portions to the LLM and say, hey, summarize based on this paragraphs that I've extracted, give me the answer to what I'm looking for. And therefore, the LLM now works with a much smaller data set and is able to also give you the uh, required answers. Now, the different variations here are how you get these uh, you know, chunks. You could just basically take the uh, output from the vector database, or you could also you know, uh, have multiple mechanisms to kind of make that better using LLMs again. And uh, that's basically what RAG is about. 
So the use cases, what? So why does why is it you know interesting for us? The use cases could be document search, it could be maintenance document search, customer service document search. It could be you could extract entities like purchase order numbers. You can find missing information and in contracts. You can summarize documents. Let's say you have a presentation tomorrow. You have to read a twenty page document. Have the LLM summarize it for you. And you can use this, deploy this as a chat bot on your website or or, in, or internally, right? So those are some of the use cases for uh, this uh, document processing and search. Um, all right, let's move on to the next topic, which is talk about our accelerators, I guess, that we have. Yeah, one of the common things you would have seen, uh, I'm sure, of late is that something new happens in the AI uh, world all the time, right? And therefore, productizing some of these things becomes a little more difficult. So we've taken a slightly different approach where we have accelerators. These are basically, I would say, 70%, 80% uh, kind of productized. But then with the ability that you can now actually customize it or in using LLM's terms, fine tune the, uh, the solution to what you require. So we have uh, different uh, accelerators within this all going under the umbrella brand of Eureka. So what we have is enterprise search. One of the most uh, common uh, solutions we're finding that customers are implementing and interested in could be Q&A over uh, you know, your PDFs or help uh, documents. Um, it can be in a simple uh, you know, querying mode, or you could also be looking at it more in a conversational mode. And we will look at that, uh, what the conversational mode to the simple querying uh, differences are. And the best part of enterprise search in this case is you can work both with structured data and unstructured data. At a high level, you can think of structured data in terms of databases. Unstructured is all the other data that you have lying around in your companies and your enterprise networks, right? PDFs, Word documents, Excel sheets, CSV files, and whatnot. And lastly, uh, something that's becoming very common these days, uh, I'm sure it must have gone to a bunch of websites where you find that rather than having a search, you actually now have a Q&A interface to uh, locate information within your website. And that's something we will see later today. Uh, document processing, Alok mentioned, you know, extraction of entities could be PO numbers, customer references, dates, you know, uh, you name it uh, from contracts or, or any of these other documents that typically you have someone looking at and then entering into an Excel or something can now be done by an agent uh, extracting it out. Uh, the YouTube GPD, uh, you can look at it more as a way to actually uh, get information from, you know, the video uh, tutorials, which are very popular of late, right? Or it could be a, a podcast or a webcast or whatever. Uh, the ability to actually now uh, chat with something like that is uh, uh, very possible simply because of the power of converting uh, the audio into transcripts, which are then searchable, very similar to how your website and other documents are. And of course, the last one, what we've uh, called data GPT uh, is more to do with querying structured uh, databases and information where typically people used to write either SQL queries or maybe work with a few technical guys to get these dashboards and other thing designed. You can actually now start querying for things like, hey, what's happened to my shipment? Uh, you know, if a particular port closes down, uh, what deliveries are going to get affected? Uh, what are the timelines looking at for you know arrivals of containers at ports and so on and so forth? All of these could be simple natural language queries that you execute, which then get converted into SQL or other queries, which finally extract data from the databases. And you could also visualize them with uh, tools which are now available uh, in terms of actually uh, seeing and understanding these pictorial representations. OK. So I think this now is the stage is set to discuss the, the main topic for today, agents. So uh, as I was mentioning uh, before, I hand it over to you, Srini, again, just to read it. So what is an agent? So agent, think of an agent that can basically do three or four different things for you, uh, accomplish your tasks and making some API calls, uh, you know, um, and uh, using some tools. So with that, um, Srini, uh, let's dive into some more details. Sure. So <clears throat> taking on, uh, you know, continuing from what uh, Alok has been speaking about. So let's look at the example we just spoke about a couple of slides ago, uh, the RAG, right? The retrieval uh, augmented generation. So what are we doing? We have a very well-defined flow where we say, okay, take the input query, search in those documents, either using vector databases or any other mechanism, right? Extract the content, pass it on to the LLM to summarize it. Now, it doesn't matter which question you ask or how many questions you ask, the same thing is going to be running again and again. So you can call it a chain of events which are kind of pre-programmed, right? So the 
use case in this particular case when you look at RAG is a typical pre-programmed uh, set of steps that the application follows. Now compare that to an agent where the agent is a little different because these steps are not programmed or uh, carved in stone, right? So you might have a bunch of tools, as they say, that are available to an agent. Now, what are these tools? These tools could be as simple as doing a Google search. Uh, it could be something specialized like looking into a database or maybe calling your SAP system and then getting some uh, you know, information out. Could be on sales orders or customer systems, et cetera, right? Customer management uh, information and all of that. So in this particular case, what you're doing with an agent is you're not defining it to say that, you know, do this, this, and this in a repetitive fashion. Instead, you give the agent the ability to think and then take decisions and what needs to be done based on the user's input. So if the user is talking about, I don't know, getting some information from a website, a RAG agent could be one of the tools that are used here, right? So it actually goes ahead and then performs queries and searches. You could also say, hey, get me those tickets which are being posted to my uh, you know, Zendesk or Jira or whichever system that you guys are using for your help desk. So now that becomes more a customer support a tool that's available for this agent. So this agent now has, two tools, right? Hypothetically, one is looking for information on a knowledge base, and the other is searching and finding uh, the status of their tickets. Now, based on what the user asks, let's say the user says, hey, how do I solve this problem? The agent then decides to go to RAG and then fetch the information and give it to you. And if you say, hey, what's the status of my ticket? Now, the agent knows that you're actually looking to search for some information based on the ticket that you've created before or somebody else posted, and then goes and finds that information. Now, I extend this to any use case you can think of. And some of those we will look at today. And that's basically what the agent does. Does not follow a pre-programmed or a preset path, but instead decides based on your inputs what it needs to do. Now, what I've been talking about so far are still interactive agents where you're actually questioning uh, last uh, info uh, look, where yeah. you're just questioning and then getting answers. Now you see this keyword autonomous agents here. Now autonomous agents go a step further where they're basically uh, non-interactive in that sense, and they're deciding and uh, helping out, uh, you know, taking decisions in terms of what needs to be done uh, next and what needs to be done uh, further. So that typically follows the different steps that you're talking about here, right? And planning is one of the most important things when you look at an autonomous agent, uh, where the agent needs to have the ability to think through in that sense to say, hey, here's a task I've been given. How do I break that down into subtasks? And then how do I execute upon each of those tasks, right? So that's really uh, the, the planning part of it. And there are multiple algorithms and steps that are put out there, a lot of papers available. The most common ones are what are called uh, React one shot. And then you have multiple variations of that in terms of how one can execute. Uh, memory is something I spoke about before where I said, typically your LLMs are stateless. They don't really have any information that they have based on your previous queries or you know what else you have discussed with the with the agent before, right? Or the uh, assistant. Uh, these two terms are being used interchangeably today, but uh, <clears throat> just to put that out there. So it is now the duty of the agent to also maintain its own memory, so that you know what the person asked before, so that a follow-up question doesn't need to specify that information again, but can be utilized from the history or the memory that the agent is maintaining. And you obviously have short-term and long-term. Most chat agents work with uh, short-term memory simply because uh, you, know, you don't want to continue a conversation that you probably had a month ago and then continue that topic. A good example, I'm sure most of you work with chat GPT is uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to have one long thread where you put all your questions but instead, you do see that there are a bunch of conversations with short threads where you've actually got your uh, you know, queries answered. And uh, tools access is something I mentioned before. Alok also mentioned APIs. So tools, like I said, could be a Google search tool, could be an SAP uh, you know, uh, creation tool where you go ahead and create, I don't know, a notification if it's a, an EAM case or maybe a, uh, a ticket on the uh, SAP side. To actually follow up on something. So each of these tools does something specific and an agent can have n number of tools that it works with. Now having said that, the typical use case is to have about 10 tools maximum per agent simply because the more the choices of tools, the agent may falter in terms of picking up the right tool to use. 
So <clears throat> we will look at uh, some examples today in terms of what the uh, the unwired uh, Gen AI agents are, but typically you're looking at stuff for uh, generic SAP uh, use cases could be on purchase orders, approvals, workflows, whatever. Uh, asset maintenance, we do have a bunch of things and we're going to see uh, some things based on notifications today, uh, later. And then of course, uh, you know, we have built some stuff already for some customers uh, in terms of claims management. Alok, I don't know if you want to add uh, further on that. No, the only thing that I want to add is that these are just some of the agents we have built, we are building. But the whole idea is um, that we want to co-innovate with uh, with our customers and with you all on the call today. So what we have done at Unwired is we have you know done the the hard work already. We built the plumbing for these agents and other apps. So if you have a use case and you know your business better than us, we are happy to work with you on whatever agents or use cases you want to deploy. So these are think of these as just examples. We say Eureka for SAP. We can have Eureka for service now also if you are interested in a help desk kind of agent, right? So these are just examples and starting points. So that's so let's move on, Srini, I guess, to some of the use cases. So go ahead. Yeah. So what I'm going to do today, and these two use cases have been, you know, uh, picked simply because they're also part of the demos today. Uh, so <clears throat> the first thing, let's look at CRM lead generation, right? Typical thing that happens via your website. So rather than having uh, a visitor actually uh, kind of hunting for the information, looking at the amount of time they're spending in the website, and then you have some kind of a, a prompt to the user or a call to action, what can actually happen is your entire interaction with the website can be controlled and, and uh, managed via the uh, Gen AI agent. So you could have the agent answering questions based on what services, what products you offer, or what are the other things you can do for the customer. And then based on the conversation, the agent can nudge the person, the visitor, to maybe provide some contact information, maybe ask for a demo, maybe ask for a site visit, depending on what you're selling. And uh, uh, you know, can set up, for example, meetings, uh, you know, rather than you sending out a, a, an invite later, can actually figure out what time works for the visitors, uh, the users, and then prospects, and then potentially have that. So that's something that you can typically do with what's called a sales uh, GPT, right? SAP is more to do with, uh, I think, again, the two flavors, the interactive thing where you can have users extracting information from systems like SAP, which are the, uh, you know, the system of record, but accessing information in spite of all the advances that have been made is still difficult, right? And uh, chat uh, agents and chat assistants give you that uh, simple, easy uh, interface and ability to actually extract information. For example, uh, you know, what are the top notifications I need to look into if you're a technician, for example, right? Don't need to really open an app and then, you know, uh, scroll through 100 notifications to figure out what you need to do. You could basically say, you know, what are the urgent stuff that I need to work on today? Is there anything that is very important that I need to look into, so on and so forth? And potentially you could use the same solution to also not just retrieve data, but create data. So it could be something as simple as creating a notification. We look at that today in a textual form, but the use cases that we're looking at these days with customers is more to do with, for example, you know, someone really doesn't want to enter text in a in a kind of a either structured or free flowing format. You basically either speak it, record uh, your audio, and then send it out, or maybe better just take a video, right, of the defect that you want to report. And the agent can actually analyze that video, extract the text to really create the notification for you, get pictures from the uh, video, right, snapshots to actually identify what's the equipment you're talking about based on the geolocation and the equipment. You can now identify its entity in SAP and then actually associate everything. And this is probably the easiest way to collect data because you're just allowing your users to now, you know, record and speak rather than having to sit and enter into an interface. Uh, so that's really where I think this is heading. So what we will see today are a couple of interactive agents but where they would be really useful is when you give them that autonomous nature to start working in the background on information that's being pumped in through various multimodal uh, you know, channels, be it uh, text, uh, image, video, and then actually have the same end result. Let's dive to the demo. So what I'm going to start with, what you're seeing is basically uh, the, uh, the web chat assistant. This is something typically you would see on a website. So in fact, what you're seeing is something that we would be embedding onto our website shortly and is actually running on data from the website. So I'm going to show that. And this is what we call as, uh, you know, the uh, 
uh, typical you know rag uh, approach basically what's uh, happened here is uh, how we have trained the system is really based on the unwired uh, website and uh, the different pages that form part of the website we've uh, kind of used that information to uh, you know, uh, train the system and then get this information there so that you can really, rather than having to search the pages to figure out where you need to go to, you can actually uh, kind of chat and then find uh, some solutions. So let me try this. So this is what is called RAG. While the example is, like I said, based on the Unwired website, it could be based on documentation, it could be based on PDF documents, CSV files, uh, doesn't matter, uh, you know, what you're looking at. So when you look for you know, services and products, so you uh, get a general information. And then when you see something maybe which is you know, of interest, so you could probably then go ahead and then you know, say, can you explain more? And because you're interested in mobile operator uh, rounds, you can actually you know, look at that. Uh, another thing which uh, I didn't point out before, but I can do that now, are the way these assistants and chat uh, rag retrievals work today is it's not just that the information is available to you, but typically the source of that information or references are also provided. So if you actually look at this, this is one of the pages uh, you know, on operator rounds from where the information has been picked up, right? And then you can go ahead and maybe ask a few more questions to kind of get you know, further information based on you know what specific information that you're searching for. Let me try this. And the other thing you can see is I'm not again and again talking about uh, the operator rounds, right? Uh, this is where the whole chat interface and the memory comes in. So let me just step back for a second and explain that. So we're talking about can you explain more on mobile operator rounds? And then we straight away go into uh, you know next question as to whether it was certified by SAP. I'm not talking about rounds specifically, but the agent or the RAG is able to figure out based on its short-term memory that, hey, I'm talking about the previous solution that I was looking at. Similarly, when we ask for case studies, uh, it knows that I'm looking for case studies for operator rounds, right? Because that's the most recent conversation I've had. And this is what we really call as uh, short-term memory. Now compare this to a typical search where when you say any case studies for this on, on Google, after searching for this, of course, these days they do have intelligence in terms of capturing that, but in a typical search interface, you wouldn't find that, right? It would give you uh, some kind of other information based on what you have searched for at that point of time. Let's say this is of interest. Now, this particular example you're seeing is just the rag. Now, just imagine that what is running behind is really the autonomous agent we were speaking about. Having seen the bunch of questions that have been asked and answered, and now that the user is asking at case study, so on, rather than just saying this is the information the assist can actually now tell you hey are you looking for a demo about this do you need any uh, phone call with uh, you know one of the uh, pre sales guys so that you know we can explain more and show you more so what happens is without being in the face uh, which is how typical web chats uh, today are where they keep popping up the moment you go into a page the llm or gen ai based agents can actually work more sophisticated give time in the conversation to get the context, get the information from the user, and then prompt, uh, you know, to tell you that, uh, you know, a demo is possible or a visit is possible. So let us try that. And you would see that this is more the passive approach. So when you talk about setting up a demo, basically it tells me what I need to do, which is to, you know, uh, go to the website and then click on the request demo button, or I can send a mail to this address or call this number. Now, when we talk about this demo in a typical assistant case or an agent case, it will prompt you to actually tell you that, you know, this is what you can do, what's the time you want to uh, you know, organize this, which part of the world are you in, so on and so forth, right? We can start getting that context and that additional information. Uh, so this is quickly what I wanted to show in terms of the, uh, the RAG, and then I want to jump into the other demo. So I need to kind of switch screens. Okay, the second one, uh, I hope you can see my uh, team screen here. Uh, the second one is uh, yes. more to do with an SAP example so that you also know or see a flavor of how we extract information, not from static uh, data like in the website, but something more to do with uh, enterprise systems. So let me search for the agent. So this is something that's already been added to the enterprise application uh, list, which I have access to. So let me just start with a very simple message to see if you know, I have my connectivity working. Okay. Initially it didn't, but now it has. So let's start uh, 
what I have here is uh, I've hooked this up to an agent which actually works on SAP notifications, which is from the EAM side. So let's see if uh, we're able to get this information out of the SAP system. Hang on. The demo bug seems to have hit me. Let me just make sure this thing works. Yeah, so let me just add some context here. So because uh, I know that some of um, the audience members here may not be very familiar with SAP. So the when we talk of notifications, we're basically talking about asset management area. So if a piece of equipment is noted as, you know, it's not working or there's a defect, then, you know, um, an alert or is created, which in the SAP jargon is called uh, notification. So, uh, so that, so what we were going to show is, you know, how, how can we create a notification in SAP uh, using an agent and even maybe do some other things post the notification. Um, so uh, that's what we're talking about as asset management scenario. But again, this could be applied anywhere. I don't think there is a question in Q&A box. Did you upload all the website data as a vector database to get this information? Yeah, that is correct. So it's more than I wouldn't use the term uh, upload, but I would really talk about uh, loading uh, the data because the vector database is something that is local to the uh, landscape here. So we basically uh, you know, scan through our what's called uh, you know, scraping uh, the website pages. So it can be done either with a uh, sitemap or you can give a specific set of URLs and then load that into the vector database as the initial step. And then once you have that information, you can then on a daily basis, for example, keep scraping if you have uh, content that changes, but that's stored in the vector database and forms the entry point into the search. <clears throat> so let me hit the uh, query, I hope. You're able to see my screen now. So when yeah. we actually talk about get my notifications here, a bunch of things are actually happening. So what first thing is done is this information. My question is going to the uh, the LLM, the Eureka agent that is behind this uh, uh, you know Q and A bot, and which analyzes my query and then figures out that I'm looking at notifications. There is no filter criteria. And this information is then given to the agent. Now the agent has access to a tool which is actually able to query and search for notifications on SAP. And this is built using our uh, no-code platform, right? The Turbo Apps uh, solution. And uh, then goes ahead and then fetches these notifications from uh, the SAP system and then sends it down uh, to the, uh, uh, the team spot. So you actually have queries going from teams into the API, LLM analyzes it, gives it back to the agent. The agent now figures out, okay, the person is looking to search for notifications, so uses that tool to actually fetch the notifications. Then it is sent back to the LLM to basically summarize and format it nicely into uh, you know, markdown tables and then is sent to the UI. So let's uh, do a little different. Let's say we say get notifications for equipment. Maybe I now do it a little differently, right? Okay, let's, this is better. And so we say get urgent notifications for the equipment because typically what you do is you don't want a laundry list of information, which is what I did first, but you're looking at trying to get things which are some things that you want to find uh, quicker. So let me try a variation, get notifications, repair. So effectively what ability the, uh, the agent is giving you is to actually search for information and then start dynamically looking at that by filtering in to, for example, look at stuff that you need simply because you're looking for something in a very urgent fashion. Tony, maybe, a quick question because people are yeah. wondering, I'm wondering, how, so is it looking for the words urgent out there or how does this work? Okay, that's the interesting part. It's a good question, Alok. So uh, if I can say that, the interesting part here is it's not actually looking for the word urgent because like I said before, I am only getting notifications from SAP as an agent. And then what the agent does is it actually passes it on to the LLM, right? And then uh, gets the LLM to summarize this. So rather than looking for the text urgent, it starts looking at uh, semantics uh, to see if uh, you know it can figure out anything else, which is why sometimes you'll see that the results vary because it's not something very deterministic like you know we're looking at uh, stuff within the database and then trying to filter that and you can see that already happening right there are some notifications which look for early fix but when we fetch the notification we're actually passing it on to the llm to summarize and there sometimes it does fail to you know give you the right answer but the 
short answer for your question is that the urgent keywords, et cetera, are not something we look directly, but we do a, a summarization and a filtering via the LLM. All right, let me do a quick time check. So, Srini, we have about um, six minutes left. Maybe we should take some questions and answers unless you want to show something very specific. Yeah, let me just do a last uh, thing just to show this uh, last uh, flavor here. So, <clears throat> like I said before, during our discussion, what we're doing here is to create the notification simply based on uh, text. But potentially, this could be something that you know we could be doing uh, based on either video, or images, or audio, right? So, but you can now see that the notification has also been created. Uh, and uh, you know, Alok, while you start looking for questions uh, to answer, let me just quickly go in here. So basically, just to recap, what you showed us was the ability for the agent to retrieve, search for information in a backend system like SAP, but not only do that, but also write back and create a transaction in SAP, right? And I think yeah. um, in the asset management area, this can be extended to you know, any other use case. Uh, but before we go to the Q&A and before people, uh, while we still have everybody on the call, again, I want to reiterate the POC offer that we have. Uh, it could either be um, you could start off with the with the very with the most popular use case, which is the search uh, of your data and and document processing. We can do that. We already have the app built for it, so that will be a very quick POC. Or we can also do any POC for you around a custom Gen AI app that you guys feel you want to differentiate and transform your business. Yeah, just to finish up on what I was showing, you see that the notification has been created in our SAP uh, test system with whatever text was put in. Most of the other information is uh, kind of defaulted, but that basically tells you uh, the power of these agents once you give them the right tools. Right, and just to kind of highlight that to, we've shown the agent, but I think what we can do is actually have the agent do three, four different tasks. So that would be where the POC would come, where we, we would be able to automate the, the workflow for you guys, uh, you know, by calling different tools, using different tools and calling various APIs. And that is what you would actually see in, in a POC should we go, should we co-innovate, um, you know, with you. Um, so with yeah. that, so Shir, what are the questions that have come up? <laughs> There's a question in chat box. What development considerations do you take in mind to assure data privacy, especially the trade secrets? See, uh, the it again depends on what's the information one is looking at. Uh, the two examples we've seen, one is public, which is a website information, so there's not really much you need to worry about. The second one is really uh, information that's within the enterprise. So typically we do this rather than having a, a web assistant on the uh, website or something, it's more... Uh, internal intranet related like you know maybe you could use teams or something uh, that's one second advantage you have with uh, utilizing a system like teams is you already have the identity authenticated so you can actually use uh, that the third thing is systems like sap or even databases allow you to have what's called role based access so that way users would end up seeing only the information that they are required to see in the off chance that you're looking at some other system, uh, it's not directly something like an SAP where you have a well-defined access control. You would have to then work through that. Uh, could be identifying the user, uh, you know, uh, and then providing information based on that. Uh, the good thing is the roles, uh, the information filtering, etc., can all be handled by LLMs. You don't really need to program, right? But you can actually have the LLM look into that information based on the tools that are available to it. Trini, I think the question may have another flavor to it. Uh, the more risk associated with Gen AI. So, for example, will the model use your data, et cetera? Okay. Uh, but can you handle that? You could deploy it on right. you know, private cloud. Right. Sorry, I missed that. So the second part of that, uh, the privacy and the security that Alok mentions is something where, you know, what I was using was actually the Google Vertex uh, AI, what's called Palm 2. That was the model I was using to uh, handle the SAP uh, agent. That's something that Google, of course, uh, hosts and provides on a public interface. They do have uh, statements out there in terms of you know, protecting that data and not really utilizing it or storing it for training and other purposes. But if that is something you don't want to take at face value, then you can utilize uh, OpenAI, for example, on Microsoft Azure in a private form, or better still, you can actually host some of these new uh, open source LLMs like Llama 2 or Mistral and so on within your enterprise, as long as you have access to you know, systems with a couple of GPUs, uh, you should be able to also host these uh, within your network. So that way, data never really leaves your landscape. So you have a choice between public, uh, hosted private, or hosted internal uh, open source. And then there's one more question I see here. Interacting with the agent, 
do you have to be educated on specific prompt language or generic language would work? The prompt is something that the agent developer needs to be aware of and keeps fine tuning and working with. But end users don't really need to, right? Because and that's the beauty of the LLM because it's extremely good at handling text. If you look at the earlier uh, generation of chatbots, maybe a few years ago, that was all based on more simple NLP understanding, right? So there you had to follow some amount of uh, structure to you know, make sure that the NLP is able to understand what you're asking for or saying. With LLMs, you have that benefit. You have typos, you make changes, you ask different ways. The LLM will be able to summarize that. And then I think we're running out of time, but we have one last question. Does OpenAI have all my data because I use it? I can take that question. Um, you know, OpenAI has stated that that whatever data is used will not be used by them. So, um, I, you know, that's their statement. So I think um, um, that's the best answer for that. Are there any other questions? I know clients are uh, open. So, oh. you know, anybody wants to ask question, they can unmute and, you know, ask question. It will be good to hear a voice. So go ahead. Yeah, quick question. Hello, uh, Srinivas. This is Akash. Uh, do you also have accelerators uh, uh, with integrations with Outlook, especially in your use cases around sales? With you mean Exchange Server or Office yes. 365? Yeah. So we so have. You can be looking into you know emails, not just sending, but basically uh, processing that as an inbound channel. So you don't need to directly route it to a CRM system, but you can actually do some extra work, categorize it, classify it, you know. Uh, Great, right? Like things forward. like being able to prompt that, hey, you need to get back to the customer, uh, a demo is pending, and got it. Correct. Okay, great. Correct. The interesting thing here is uh, Microsoft Office already has a lot of those tools. So if you're looking at something like that, I think you should probably check out what Microsoft is already offering a standard Office 365 with Copilot. And we can always extend that as necessary. Okay. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Akash. Okay. There is another question How does this capability change traditional app development? Okay. So, is it any different now? <laughs> the one, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether the question is related to, you know, are we developing differently or is it helping us to develop better? Uh, but I think it is true in both cases, right? Uh, Chat GPT, for example, has been a big boon uh, via Copilot to really help in development. But on the other hand, if you look at traditional software implementations and projects and compare them to Gen AI projects, they're very different. Uh, where traditional projects, I think, or standard software projects have more of a defined uh, path in terms of, you know, implementation, UAT, maintenance. Uh, Gen AI is so dynamic, it keeps changing every time. And therefore, I don't think there is still anything that you can call as a maintenance phase in that. You have to keep taking the new changes, improving it, and and fixing stuff. Yeah, but, but the one thing still remains true, and we didn't talk about it, maybe a subject for another webinar. You still have the like just like the, the the operational aspect of it you know yeah de developing a gen ai app is fine but then you have the same issues how do you monitor the model how do you monitor the the output how do you you know uh, optimize your costs so all those issues that are traditionally associated with app, you know app, app dev over the life cycle very much remain with gen ai app at, at the end of the day it is still an app so uh yeah. is, is it i think the term they here? use alok for that is compared to devops before they now call it llm or ml ops that's the only change Challenges remain. All right. I think we've come to the end of our time. We will have another webinar uh, in the month of Feb. Um, so everybody have a great holiday and uh, happy new year in advance, much in advance. We'll talk to you. And if you please take us up on our offer, POC offer, just email us or you know how to find us. Love to co-innovate with all of you. Once again, thank you everyone for your time today. Goodbye.